Article 25 is an architectural NGO based in both London and in Yangon, in Myanmar. And we deliver uh, design uh, to improve healthcare, to improve education, disaster risk reduction in areas in the world where good design is the most needed and not always available. One very important component of our work is uh, capacity building on the ground. So that involves uh, a collaboration with local architects, with local consultants, involvement of local communities and authorities, etc. And it ranges from collaboration with a Moroccan architect uh, uh, to deliver a good clinic for children in Ushta in Morocco uh, that also includes environmental, strategic, smart design decisions to working together with uh, projects from the Ministry of Construction in um, Myanmar to help them set up a good project brief for uh, healthcare facilities for Yangon General Hospital. These projects would not happen if we wouldn't support on the ground, so it's extremely important. Um, tonight, uh, our speaker, uh, if you want to know more about these projects, you can visit our website, uh, www.article-25.org, or speak to um, one of our staff. And there are a lot of people present here tonight, so just uh, ask them. Tonight we'll talk about another project, and I'll introduce you to our main speaker, Jatin Ladd. Um, he's an architect based in both Manchester and in Pondicherry in uh, India, and uh, through his architecture, uh, he has believed that through architecture and good design practices, you can actually make social change. Um, he will talk about the Sharanam, if I pronounce it right, Center for Rural Development um, in Pondicherry in India. This building was built um, with local people. The architect went on the ground to train local people to build up um, this building. And it's a building that forms an example for both sustainable development, but also uh, a design that can make a change, a social change in this area. He will explain much more about this in his talk that will last about uh, 35, 40 minutes. After that, we'll have a panel discussion uh, chaired by Sunan Prasad, who is uh, the chair of Article 25, but also co-founder and uh, senior partner of Penor and Prasad, and uh, former president of the RIBA. Um, he will introduce the panel afterwards, and I will uh, finish up with a, with a quick uh, thank you. So, um, I'd like to welcome Jatin Laat. Josine, thank you very much for the intro. And uh, I wasn't expecting such a big crowd, but thank you all for coming. Uh, before I start, I do want to convey my thanks to our high profile panel, to Hanif and his team here for hosting us, and of course to Article 25 um, for the invitation, but also for setting up this series. For those of us who've been working off radar for many years now, this is a very welcome platform whenever we come back to London. So thank you very much. So this evening I'll be presenting our Sharanam Centre for Rural Development. Uh, which is a long-term project we did in South India. Sharanam is not the name of a place, but it means shelter and refuge. And it was created for a non-profit called Sarvam, who work with seriously undeveloped villages. And it was generously funded by the Cadbury Foundation. The building was designed and built in five stages and was completed four years ago. So when I think back about this building and what we actually did, an Indian saying comes to mind, which is Shunya Mati Sarjan. I don't know if anyone knows what that means, but it means to create something out of nothing. And that is still a possibility in our profession, <coughs> but more so in deprived contexts where you have so many constraints, so few resources, next to no professional support. And more than ever, you have to rely on your sense of empathy, humanity, most of all, courage to take on issues which are really in your face. So there's a little bit more involved in these type of projects than just doing a nice building. And in fact, this entire project, that's the design, the construction, and the form of practice 
that was developed was shaped by issues on the ground 5,000 miles away. But they're relevant to our profession here today. Issues of environmentalism. So we've just had the IPCC report talking about embodied energy. Completely bleeding obvious, but I mean, I don't know why you need a report for that. Social value of architecture. And I'm delighted we've got Flora Samuel with us this evening. And then alternative procurement, whereby architects take the initiative to reclaim the centre ground on projects. There's a tonne of work in this. Um, <coughs> so in about 35 minutes, I'm going to give you a flavour of the context and issues without which there is no project. I'll show you the building, how we built it, and then at the end I'll stick my neck out and try and evaluate whether it was successful or not. So, where are we? <coughs> so like many humanitarian projects, there is a personal beginning. And those of you in the audience who know me, I used to work in London until the end of 2004, and I ended up taking an extended break, and I ended up in this delightful place called Pondicherry which is old French India, but you may also know it from the life of Pi. Now Pondicherry and the surrounding state of Tamil Nadu is what I would call a sensory blast. You have fertile tropical landscapes, soaring, deafening ancient temple cities, and possibly the most colourful and make-believe political scene anywhere in the country. All <laughs> all powered by Photoshop. <coughs> <laughs> so he's getting an Oscar and the Presidential Medal of Freedom. <laughs> <coughs> now during this time, I had, there were two <coughs> encounters which laid the seed for this project. First was the Indian Ocean tsunami. And at the time, I, I wrote a lot, especially in the British press, about how, despite scenes like this, on the ground, the tsunami was seen as a spectacle as opposed to a humanitarian disaster. The second experience was to meet Sarvam. And this was a new NGO working with chronically impoverished villages outside Pondicherry. And their director told me, in these villages, every day is a tsunami. Now, according to experts, <coughs> these communities were bottom of the scale in just about every development metric you can think of. Poverty, literacy, health, housing, drinking water, sanitation, the list is endless. And the places just look completely smashed up. This is Tripti, an assistant from our, on the project, who's actually from Bombay, and she had never seen anything like it. Alcoholism was rampant. There was an appalling level of domestic violence and neglect of girls and the elderly. Very few people had employable skills. There was no jobs, no aspiration. It's what Sarvam called a deep, heavy inertia. But from a cluster of huts, Sarvam started transforming villages. They transformed two entire villages in 2007. Um, that's about 7,000 people, by making them active partners in a range of development initiatives. And they approached me to help expand their outreach. So it's interesting, they actually asked an architect, not a development expert. So we had a very enlightened client. And together, we proposed a new centre that would be accessible to all the villages in the area and that would allow Sarvam to upscale their work. And they were concentrating on health, education, income generation, and self-development. Now, this really was the type of work I had wanted to do for years. So I shifted to Pondi <coughs> and set up an office with the help of the client. But of course, there's no money. So we pitched the vision and financials and secured a long-term funding partnership with the Cadbury Foundation from the UK. Dramatically increased their operating budget and 
there was just nothing by way of design. It was actually putting forward a case about the social benefits of this proposal. And we then worked with the client to focus that investment on acquiring land and project costs, um, expanding their activities and upgrading all the houses in the area, which is a different project. So when you do a project like this, a really good place to start is the local building traditions. And if you strip away all the ornamentation, <coughs> Tamil architecture, which is quite not very well known actually, is essentially an architecture of a large roof and a raised floor. And whether it's temples, village houses or mansions, rooms are actually peripheral. Life is played out in the open on these raised platforms called a tinai which is where you can sit, you can lean, you can eat, you can receive guests and even sleep. And that informed the initial sketch. This is done like within two days. And I know design is iterative, but it is remarkable how many times your very first instinct and in response to conditions gets built in some form many years later. What about skills and resources? Now, until recently, every roof in this part of South India was covered in these half round tiles. And we drove 80 kilometers from village to village, and we found one guy who could still make these tiles. Well, he last made them eight years before. So these generational skills were not declining, they were more or less lost. And we all know why it's happening, and that's, it's happening all over the world. Now, I'm not going to start on the, Indi the remarkable Indian construction boom, and it really is remarkable. In the time it takes frameworks in this country to deliberate over a project, they have rebuilt entire cities and pulled people out of poverty. It's quite remarkable. But there are a couple of critical points. The vast majority of this is standardised, high-energy, low-skill construction built by migrant labour. So in South India, it's North Indian workers and vice versa because, as every contractor and developer will openly tell you, is to stop the workers running away. And they are expected to live in squalor on the building site, working all hours of the day. And just to clarify, I was asked this once, uh, women do not work on building sites because of gender equality. And because it has become effectively a race to the bottom, one of the consequences is an exploitation of land, people and resources. And the environmental and human cost which I've seen for so many years is now being reported in mainstream media. I think there's a similar exhibition at the building centre right now in but Blood Bricks in Cambodia, I think. You should go and check it out. Now, by the way, I do wonder if, practice, if, you ha if you're a practice working in India, a UK practice working in India, whether you're even aware of this or whether you look into it. And if you are specifying, let's say, for example, Indian granite, and it, you need to know your supply chain, because if it comes from a private quarry in this part of South India, the chances are your building is not as sustainable as you think. <coughs> Let me come back to our project. Now this is <coughs> right across the road from our site. Hundreds and hundreds of acres of village land destroyed by illegal quarrying and local hospitals burn their toxic waste there now. So this is before we started. So in light of all these issues, we now have a comprehensive project brief. Could we help expand Sarvam's development reach by building a stimulating building with local people and local resources in an ethical and socially empowering way? Just one other issue. There's just, just endless issues, actually. <coughs> now, normally, you transfer responsibility to a local executive architect. 
Now, there are some good architects in this region, but the type who would partner for a project of, of this size and scale, well, let's just say there are issues of design capability, but more importantly, professionalism and trust. And contractors are notorious for running away with the money, leaving buildings unfinished, completely screwing the client. And this engineering college um, in the same region is not too bad an example, believe it or not. So we're talking about rural India. This isn't the big, this isn't Bangalore and Mumbai. So some free advice. If you want to build a high quality, different building in an ethical way in this part of the world, you have to build it yourself or find a system which allows you to do that and that's what we did. So with no contractor we provided more wider, sort of more holistic, I would say more old school services uh, including full cost and construction management to ensure quality ethical standards and transparency in accounts. And that's an important point you'll see in the, one of the last slides. But again, this was exactly the type of work I'd wanted to do. So it was about positioning ourselves at the center, driving the project and making it happen. So the project ine inevitably starts with the, the land itself, the site, which was very abused. It was actually a dumping ground for dead animals. And before any design, we revived um, and healed through e extensive plantation and revived a, well, revived a traditional drip irrigation practice in the process. But I think we may have actually overdone it because today you can barely see the building. You just catch glimpses of it. So, but it is a lot cooler on site. There's a long meandering path through all this new greenery which leads to the entrance, which is shaped around rainwater ponds and existing trees. And there's a large amphitheater cut into the natural slope of the site. Now, during briefing, the client was advised to think of what were their short-term and long-term objectives. And so the project includes a number of single-storey office buildings for researchers to collect data on the ground and hopefully have an input on social policy in the region, and that is now happening. And the language of the building is very simple. It's these solid, earthbound offices sliding under a large vaulted superstructure, which is very light and transparent. So the superstructure comprises an array of six vaults, under which are a variety of gathering and activity spaces, all very loosely defined by folding walls, level changes and water bodies. The primary materials are earth, and granite. And the massive granite slabs actually step down towards the main hall, very much like an old Tamil temple. And the thin skylights um, really lighten the superstructure, so it feels less like a Victorian tunnel. The gentle slope of the site was used to create a sectional building, minimizing footprint and keeping down costs. And the main hall is very simple. It's a very simple multi-use space. It's comfortable for 25 people, 50, 250. And it's enclosed <coughs> by the granite thinai, which I explained earlier, and which extends on the far side to form a deep stage. We have generous spill-out spaces on both sides, and it's entirely open to nature, giving a sense of dignity, um, tranquility, well-being which means it's naturally ventilated, with coastal breezes being funneled in through these piers. And we embedded water pipes in the floor. So we're actually able to achieve thermal comfort in this building without the use even of fans. 
So it's 45 degrees Celsius outside, 100% humidity, and we're 32 degrees inside. So it's that temperature differential which, is the, which provides the cooling. You don't need to be 25 degrees. And behind the stage, there's a very simple circular space, again, just integrated with nature. For small, this is just for smaller group activities. This is their favourite space, actually. We have these freestanding walls which thread their way through the piers and they guide circulation through the building, separate public and private, but also anchor these office buildings to the main building. And the spaces in between are designed as cool, shaded verandas, essential to keep the buildings cool. And there are four separate offices arranged around small courtyards which trap cool air. And externally, they appear very closed and solid, but internally, they're very transparent. And um, they're also kept cool because I thought about how we have cavity wall in the UK. Well, it works wonders in South India. Ventilated cavity wall, no insulation, but we've got insulated roof gardens. So it's very, very cool inside these buildings. And the walls are just blank masonry walls. It's a perfect canvas for the changing light conditions and shadows. So the buildings are actually quite simple. They're very austere. They're not overly articulated in any way. And this was quite a deliberate design approach because influenced by this. This is Bal Krishna Doshi's Aranya housing from the mid 80s. And he designed these homes for very poor families with really considered plans, very tightly planned. I mean, he was, it was it, this is um, humanitarian architecture at its best. But the moment the people, the families moved in, they started making all manner of changes. And the point is that in a development context, even the most humane designs by the very best of architects can be deemed inappropriate, and in this case actually cause lots of other problems. So based on this lesson, the spaces at Sharanam are not prescriptive in any way, but more of a framework. Just a variety of spaces of different scales which can be used anyway. And I've always thought of the building as more of a setting in the landscape. It should look like it's always been there. A background which comes to life when people with colourful clothing move through it. And so far, nothing has been chopped up, changed, bricked up, smashed up. So I think as a design approach, it's been so far so good. <coughs> okay, now for the real stuff. How did we build this? Now, during pre-design, we weighed up lots and lots of materials and techniques, particularly with regards embodied energy. But the answer was always in front of us. The soil composition of the site is very, appro <coughs> very appropriate for earth construction. And you can't get any more local or sustainable than that. So we excavated at the lowest point of the site and from that hole built that building. Well, much more than what you see there. And we got a rainwater reservoir in the process. Now, I'm not at all advocating you go around digging pits. This is a site-specific solution. The very next farm has a different soil composition entirely. And when the soil is sieved, it's absolutely beautiful. It kind of glows. It's mixed with 5% cement by volume, from which over 200,000 compressed earth blocks were manufactured of nine different sizes we had. Now, compared to normal fired bricks, these are very high quality. They're precise to half a millimetre, three times the compressive strength, half the cost, and one-tenth of the embodied energy because they're not fired. They gain strength by being wet-cured under the hot sun. There's also no trashing of the environment, 
and humane working conditions. Not sure you can see that, but there are lots and lots of earth-based techniques in this building. There's rammed earth foundations, we've got the compressed earth blocks in the piers, walls, and, uh, and the vault. Using earth mortar, earth concrete, and a variety of earth-based plasters. And in fact, all the components you see on this section are handmade on site using basic tools, except the rainwater pipes. But sustainability isn't about number crunching, it's also about the human element. And the process of construction is as important as the building itself. And both the client and I were actually drawn to a precedent done way back in Pondicherry itself. This is Golkond. It's India's first modernist building from 1935. It's very close to our office, and I think there are people here who've been to see it. And it's, how it's a housing block for the famous Aurobindo ashram, and it's designed by the American architect Antonin Raymond, who, with his assistant, built this without a contractor, guided workers step by step. And at the end of his career, in the 60s, Raymond reflected on this project. Now, this guy was prolific, but he's now reflecting on, what, on this one project. And he's written, the conditions under which the work was done were so remarkable, the purpose was not primarily the housing. It was the materialization of an idea by which workers might learn, experience, develop through contact with the erection of a fine building. Now, to a bunch of cynical architects, that sounds all very lofty and ideal. But given our context and issues I showed earlier, this was precisely the spirit of building we were drawn to. So, as well as employing local village workers, could we train them, upskill them, empower them, and improve long term livelihoods by building Sharanam? So basically, could we carry out the whole construction phase, top to bottom, as a development project in its own right? And that's precisely what we attempted. So block making. <coughs> Unemployed men and women from nearby villages with no prior training are guided step by step in the whole sequence of work. It's deliberately labor intensive to guarantee employment and generate income. And the work was done with great care, precision, and with a really healthy sense of teamwork. And at the end of this, uh, a group of these guys set up a manufacturing plant, which, um, and they supplied bricks for our future projects. The same with rammed earth foundations. It's such a cost-effective alternative to reinforced concrete where possible. And these foundations are rock hard. Now, as an example of a worker with no prior skill, construction skill, everyone's got skills, let me introduce you to Ilango. Now, this guy is built like a middleweight boxer, and we hired him as the site security guard. But within one year, he had learned every stage of block making, rammed earth, bits of masonry, and <coughs> He was responsible for all the planting and irrigation. He can also bend you a reinforcement cage by hand. <laughs> so don't mess. And speaking of reinforcement, reinforced concrete is used very sparingly only for critical uh, structural elements such as the Springer Beam rainwater gutter. And as everywhere in India, the reinforcement is fabricated by hand on site. And we would draw out all the reinforcement. We designed the reinforcement, we prepared full-scale templates that they could follow for the links. And it's not mindless labour, it's precision work with basic tools, such as using a water pipe to create a three millimetre camber at the exact midpoint of the tie rod. So when the vault is built, it pushes out on the Springer beam, straightens the rod in tension to counter the lateral thrust.
Now, midway through the project, we were joined by an unexpected and new type of unskilled worker. And I'm not sure how some of you will take this. University graduates. <laughs> they had degrees, some of them had two, but absolutely no skills, and there were no jobs anyway. So a great example is my friend Mani Kandan, who wanted to learn skills as opposed to, say, working in a call centre. And from scratch, he became multi-skilled in a variety of trades, and he became my foreman for the second half of the project. Now, one incentive in learning new skills was a very transparent payment system that we set up. And distributing payments <coughs> at the end of the week was a wonderful ritual. The workers would wash, change clothes, say a prayer, and individually sign a payment chart and get their full pay, whether they were working individually or part of a, con a trade contractor's team. And many learned to write their names for the very first time. In fact, some of them write their names differently every week. <laughs> but um, there was no withholding. There was no retention. There was no cutting of wages if there was a mistake. And everyone signed on the same chart. So you could see what everyone else is on. And they picked up very quickly. The more you learn, the more you earn. It was pretty simple. Most importantly, the workers set their own rates of pay at market rates. So even a guy who's got no skill, he will ask for market rates. And we didn't, we didn't uh, <coughs> counter it in any way. This wasn't built on cheap, you know, half wages. This is built on full market rates. Normal nine to five working hours, not morning till night. And negotiation was never necessary. It was a very beautiful system which built up trust right from the start. Now these guys, now wor working with masons in India can really dampen your expectations, particularly in a place like Pondicherry, which is not a big city, and especially if you're proposing load-bearing exposed masonry. And you can see why. The vast majority of masons simply infill concrete frames. They just eyeball the whole thing at speed and they cover it in cement render, which they do very beautifully. So. One of the things I've been saying is that this construction boom that's going on, particularly in the non-metro cities, has de-skilled an entire generation of workers. I would say the masons <coughs> we had at Sharonam, of which we had about over 50, they only knew how to do, they only knew how, knew how to use a trowel. That was it. That's basically all they knew. So they were trained in the basics on the job, step by step, mixing and laying earth mortar, how to bed a brick, Tolerance. I mean, this isn't like five inch tolerance, this is millimeters. Setting up guides, taking plumb lines, bonding. No one knew what bonding was, how to bond bricks. No idea. Pointing. And this was done through close supervision, demonstrations, and very simple coded drawings, which they learned to read very quickly. And for us, it was just a printing exercise. It was certainly slow going. There were errors which were tolerated but always corrected, but the work was very carefully and precisely done. And whenever I checked DIMS on site, like every other day, and triangulated, it was spot on. I mean, to within four mil. It's absolutely astonishing. And uh, I would say the quality of masonry was far better than anything I've dealt with here. We revived lime plastering and experimented and tested a whole array of earth-based plasters, such as in the top corner you'll see a hand-troweled kerosene finish, which creates a reflective, cool-to-touch surface. Feels like marble. Now we take masonry to another level entirely with, with this building large vaults without any formwork. In other words, the vaults are self-supporting during construction. They're not, you don't need a keystone to set the vault in compression at the end. 
And there are quite a few techniques for doing this. We haven't created this. this is, there, are, there are a number of techniques, and they've been around since the late 19th century. The span is nine and a half meters, and the thickness at the center is only nine centimeters. Now, I would need a lot of time to explain how to do this step by step, but if you are interested, I'll, I will show you. I'll come down and show you for you know, an afternoon. <laughs> but, very briefly, you need two specially fabricated templates with welded struts guiding the mortar joints, and you lay them at either end of the vault, and something as sophisticated as nylon string, which is stretching between the two. The first course is laid on top of the form, and you can see the bricks decreasing in size to nine centimeters. And the second course is bonded to the first, but the form work doesn't move. It's a very thin mortar. It's a very thin earth mortar. It's actually one millimeter, which is applied like butter on bread. And you work from both ends towards the middle. And it works in a very simplistic way, it works according to two principles. The first is the profile of the vault, which is adjusted or optimised, so the resultant force in each brick passes through the middle third of the next brick. So the profile is effectively a line of force. There's no extraneous material. And that's another way of looking at sustainability, I suppose. Can you, can you build the strongest possible structure with the least amount of material? The second principle is capillary action, which, as we all know from physics, is a seriously strong force. The block is dipped in water a split second before you apply the mortar. And that triggers capillary action, and you place the brick following the guidelines, but you've got to be fast. You <coughs> cannot have cigarette breaks and answer your phone whilst doing this. So again, local masons trained on the job, in this case within a week, and compared to, compared to the other packages of work on this project, this was by far the fastest and actually the easiest because it was so repetitive. Once they got it, I mean, this was a four-month contract which they completed in eight weeks. So they took home a big profit. Skills transfer is never one way, despite what any architect will tell you, particularly with more skilled workers and experienced trade contractors. And it was very collaborative. And we had over 22 trade contracts with local workers here. Yes, there was always resistance. No, f no different from here. You try telling a contractor how to do something, it's the same over there. But it was about getting them to buy into the design by incorporating their inputs, a little compromise, I would say, so that they had the confidence to take on contracts which were way beyond anything they had attempted before. And this took workmanship and details to another level. So, for example, we've got Mustafa here. Now, this guy can lay, lay stone flooring in his sleep. But here, he learnt and figured out how to do a large three-dimensional stone installation with over 430 bespoke pieces. He used to photograph his achievements at the end of every day. And you can see one part of it, that's the waterfall behind the stage. It's quite a nice uh, in-situ bridge there as well. We have the architect in the audience. The thing about this stonework is there's no grout anywhere. These are tight butt joints. It's what we call paper joints. Precasting. Palani here was a master mason in precasting. And these two centimetre thick channels formed the structural soffit for the offices. Again, another alternative to reinforced concrete. And we set up a precasting plant on site, training lots of young masons manufacturing a whole range of perfectly fitting components which could be assembled by low-skilled workers. Again, the carpenter, 30 years of experience in India's construction industry, but he'd never attempted uh, pseudo-tropical brutalism. <laughs> and he was guided every step of the way, piece by piece.
And something very common in India, tradi traditional pigmented finishes taken further than usual by applying them dual tone and three-dimensionally. And it's very, very crisp and finely done. We operated a zero-waste site as far as possible. From all the leftover earth blocks, we built an entire toilet block. That's about a quarter of it. I'm writing a paper, actually, about how caste in India influences architecture. There was a different toilet block for every caste in this one building. They wouldn't share. And even the pebbles sieved out of the excavated soil at the beginning of the project were hand laid as a flooring finish at the end. Hmm. Now, now this, this thing crawled out <coughs> next to my foot during a site meeting. Um, the project was not undertaken in a cocoon, despite what it might, what it might seem like. There were many, many unforeseen delays completely out of our control, and they increased cost. It's the reason I've got grey hair, and it's one of the reasons we had so many workers. Now, some of these issues are completely commonplace. They affect every single building project in India. Others are down to lack of professionalism, I mentioned earlier. Some are project-specific. For example, the well-publicised takeover of Cadbury the whole building had to be redesigned because Kraft simply did not have a philanthropic um, you know, basis for their work. They wanted to go into India for commercial reasons only. So the project was completely designed halfway through. And others, more seriously, are the effects of turbulent local politics. I mean, intra-caste violence, not inter-caste, intra people of the same caste trying to kill each other, spreading to the building site. And we had to close the site for eight months. So one of the disadvantages of being at the centre of a project like this is that the architect is responsible for every single internal project detail, but also for every external challenge. Our client, I know this is being recorded, but our client was hopeless with all of these issues. So... Has it been a success? Well, working from the bottom up certainly was. If you look at the numbers, I mean, we directly employed and upskilled um, the majority of about of the 300 people who worked on this project. And working and learning together created a real sense of identity, belief, ownership, pride. And we use the construction funds to, as an investment to improve long-term livelihoods. So today, previously unskilled workers are working as masons, fabricators, plasterers, stone workers. Masons are now proper masons, and some have even become contractors. And trade contractors are taking on some seriously lucrative work in the cities. If I do have a regret, it was that we were unable to upskill women to the level that we thought about and we could not even get we could not even attempt to equalize their pay not because of resistance from the site workers but from their husbands now as demanding as this may seem this was actually for me a very enriching work culture and has become a very fulfilling way of practice this is the kind of way I build my buildings in some form or other. And it's one that younger architects definitely have got an appetite for. So in 2011, we were joined by nine graduates from one diploma unit at Manchester University. Well, they'd just graduated. <coughs> and they volunteered <coughs> and joined the team for up to eight months, getting hands-on design and build experience, as well as learning the traditional site skills of architects, like setting out, supervising, running a building site, procuring materials, sorting out problems on the spot, paying workers. And you can ask them yourselves, but I would like to think it was a formative experience for them. 
Now, I keep learning that it's not important whether we as architects like our buildings, it's whether our clients like them and whether they benefit from them. So we can talk about costs, I mean, about process, sustainability, upskilling all day, but money talks for clients, especially NGOs. Now, our wide scope of services certainly accrued higher professional costs, 25%. But, compared to local architects, we created a one-off building of far superior quality at half local construction costs. And the client knew it. And I've heard that the land value has increased 2,500% since acquisition. So, but of course it's more than just about cost. Sarvam's aim was to expand their scope and reach. Well, for the first year and a half, there was no change because they didn't move in. And this building just sat forlorn and empty. And it was completely dispiriting. But once they did, Salvam's reach has increased from two to over 40 villages. That's from 7,000 to 150,000 people, resulting in vastly improved education standards, better health, particularly for the elderly, and more empowerment for women. <coughs> and there is lots and lots of measurement going on. And the building has raised our client's profile enormously. In fact, it's been quite transformative. Sarvam are now considered a proper development agency that governments want to partner with. They attract international visitors, volunteers, recognition from the UN, the World Bank, and new long-term funding. Incidentally, I was, asked, I was actually requested by the client to personally show the heads of these multinationals the building. And that shows that architects' control of the narrative of projects can actually continue to give benefits to clients well after it's finished. So given these outcomes, I would say the building hasn't just met the client's expectations, it's transcended them. They had no idea a building like this could be built in this way with these kind of benefits. But as I keep telling them, the potential is even greater. There are over 200 villages in this district within an hour from this project. And as is common with these type of projects, it's now down to them to maximize what has been created. So projects like this show that our skills are clearly needed in communities that are left behind, whether they're in the UK or internationally. And it is possible to create beautiful buildings and facilitate significant social change in the process. So I think I'm going to stop there. I hope you found some of this interesting, maybe even useful. Don't give me a round of applause, but certainly give these guys, who are part of the best crew I've ever worked with, a big hand. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jatin. That was incredible, inspiring, wonderful. Can I ask the panel to come and say something similar? It, absolutely amazing. Uh, and join. Come, come here, Bo. Yeah. Sit here? Yeah. Why don't you sit there? Yeah, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. They've taken that place. So, we'll, uh, uh, how long do we have? We have uh, about half an hour for Q and A. You can stay that long, Flora, can you? <coughs> um, I'm sure there's, there are people wanting to ask questions. But uh, um, that is, you know, far and away, one of the most extraordinary stories of its kind that I've heard. So, y you know, you're being very <coughs> modest about thanking those guys and not you and all that. But actually, <coughs> it, it, is, it is amazing what you've done. And I'm sure we'll, we'll discuss the replicability of it and what, it's, what the lessons that flow from it are. Um, so, while everybody's thinking of a question, I'm, I'm going to, to see if anybody here wants to pitch in. Uh, how about left to right, Flora, would you like to oh, well say something? 
I've seen Jatin doing this presentation in about five minutes and just getting the, the breadth of hearing what you've been up to is absolutely wonderful. And um, I don't know if people are aware, but I'm obs obsessed about how architects demonstrate their value and express their value and even quantify and monetize their value. So not only is it a wonderful building, but I really so much enjoy hearing the, the way you talk about the value brought to the, uh, to the table uh, in all sorts of ways that aren't just the architecture. Um, and I'm all, it's also music to my ears because we're, we're moving forwards and developing a kind of toolkit for social architecture. And um, the things that you're talking about, things like connecting people, flexibility, affordability, um, positive ways of thinking about the, uh, being in nature, uh, um, and different kind of lifestyles and health are all things that we're, we're, we're looking at as indicators. And, and you were just a beautiful, that project was just a beautiful example of that these, I really do firmly believe that we can describe uh, the value of architects I think there used to be a time when people got very hoity-toity and upset and architects are artists and you can't describe their value. But I think we're getting to a point where we really can. And we, indeed we have to, otherwise, you know, uh, <laughs> we won't get listened to and certainly um, in, in conversations with NGOs or clients or actually governments um, will just be left out in the cold. Uh, I think it's a good point to turn to an engineer <laughs> since we're talking about architects so much. Not many architects talk about cambers um, pre pre-load pre cambers and one third of the um, cross-section being the line of force and things like that. Any thoughts on what does it take to do this kind of thing, Hanif? Because you're actually often, um, often act like an architect. You're not just an engineer. Not that there is such a thing, such a thing as just an engineer, but you're, you're a, <laughs> yourself a polymath. <laughs> Well, I think that there is there's a positive and a negative. Um, I think there is a tendency to assume that all things technical need technical people. Um, you have to start with b very basic skills, and, and most of us know that starts when you're a child and depends what you played with uh, all your life. So, in, as for an engineer, it's it's easier to some extent. Than, than an architect because you also have to find <coughs> qualitative value and demonstrate qualitative value. So in that regard, I applaud the whole process and, and the storytelling. On the negative side, I worry a little bit that the assumption is sweat proves quality. You know, and If you only do things by hand and go through those processes, it proves a certain kind of uh, you know, achievement um, by an architect. So there is a balance to play. I think where Jatin succeeded enormously is, I, don't, I have never been to Pondicherry, but he's actually lived, worked there, so he knows the context. And uh, the, the kind of balance I was putting across is really a critique of what I'm seeing all over the world, where these kind of projects have not only become the fashion, but they're pedagogical tools for all the universities. It's, we you know, everywhere. I teach at Harvard and every, um, semester, the most popular ones are those who are building schools in Rwanda. It's quite hilarious because when you think about it, you know, so even very well-known architects in, in our world are trying to build this kind of stuff over there. Um, and I keep telling them you can't do it with drones because catapults <coughs> will bring the drones down because the catapults in Africa are pretty good. And this kind, so I, I think that there is a critique uh, at two levels. Why I like this project a lot is we see the guy who actually did it. He can tell us all the stories, nooks and crannies, what went wrong. Um, and, and therefore, I would say, excellent. Thank now, you. the basics of structural engineering shouldn't need an engineer because most of us should be able to draw for the first time something that will stand up. And I think that's where he started from. You know, when you draw a curve, you know, mm -hmm. it will load, you know, it's the, the load is passing through a shape, whether it's that way or a catenary in the other direction. It's very basic stuff that we then complexify when you bring it to engineers. You know, we try and make it as difficult as possible and try and prove to you that 
but what will happen if you don't come to us is uh, it'll fall apart. <laughs> so it's good that he didn't he didn't fall for that one. I did go yeah. to an engineer. <laughs> 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 I'll tell you a story about it though, if you want. Uh, the last thing to say is that I think the, the 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 risk issue that he brought up at the beginning is probably the other, um, from an engineer's perspective. There's, I think you're talking about social values, political values, craft, and things. One of the biggest problems is architecture in the last 50 years has become risk averse. And what has happened is you've thin sliced your disciplines and then you blame us for it. Mm -hmm. Most architects that are really famous are artists and, and image makers. They don't really know what a facade is. They don't really know how to do a drawing mm -hmm. that involves a structural engineer or an m and &E engineer. So I think thin slicing is your own problem. Um, I would stop at that for now. I've got a lot more to say. But yeah, I can see that's that. enough. <laughs> I can see that. Okay, thank you very much. Um, both. Well, I'd actually quite like to pick up on that point. Yeah. No, because there is um, something quite interesting about the sort of architect's obsession with precision. Um, and then, you know, if we talk about, and, and uh, in a way, it's sort of come about because of mass production and the, the ability to replicate things are exactly the same. Uh, but then when you return to craft, to hand making things, to hand using tools, the idea of, you know, as you mentioned in your talk, using rules of thumb, you know, the basic principles of how things work. Yes, you might not have an engineer in sight, but you understand the middle third, you know, these sorts of things. Um, you only really gain that experience through a project like this and the way that you di did it like this without machinery, without factories to, to produce bricks for you. Um, and really having to go back to those fundamental basics of understanding architecture and engineering. Um, so on that, on that note, I think, yes, precision, rule of thumb, you know, where are we going next? We, we're, you know, we've got this whole other side of architecture which we're not really dealing with here, which is digitalization of everything. How can we build that in so that we're not this sort of niche little um, area of work? How do we make this much bigger, I mm. suppose? Uh, I mean, in a way, there's, isn't there a danger always that you see something fantastic and then you wanted to answer all these other questions as well, instead of actually just staying with the fantastic and appreciating it in, in its own terms? Uh, I think that's a very interesting question. So what about digital and what about you know, because I think what you're really saying fundamentally is that there's a danger of fetishizing craft uh, and the modern world isn't like that. You know, that's kind of what you're saying. I think, I think that is a very good uh, question to, to discuss, whether that really is true or not, because the modern world isn't necessarily how the modern world is described, you know, by certain people in the modern world. But, um, but, but, but that, I think I would like to keep, run that one a bit the other thing I'd like to run is, is the value of the architect. And I wonder why we keep saying the value of the architect, because what, I mean, I, an engineer could have, it's not as if, it, you know, I think you're using the word architect in a very particular way. I thought that all the way through, because you often, it was actually, you were talking about you. You're talking about what you did, but you're saying the architect can have this, or the architect can, as if that is an exemplar of what an architect might be. And I wonder if it's a, an example of how the architect might be, or does it have to be an architect? It's just somebody with a bigger vision and a bigger mission. Yep. So can we uh, run those two things? Maybe, Flora, you could, you could talk about the fetishize. We can cross over a bit. You talk about the, the, um, the, the danger of fetishizing craft. And actually, generally, I think what you're also saying in terms of the Rwanda projects, that there is a kind of uh, indulgence by certain people in, you know, in comfortable countries to actually double, this is exactly what Chatin is not doing, yeah. but actually one of the kind of spin-offs, and famously Fashid Musavi uh, uh, waded into this one, saying how the people who did work in, in, in humanitarian architecture was because they couldn't, they weren't any good at design. You know, that was a kind of her, her charge. So I think there is a, there are, there is a, a nexus here about, about the, you know, exactly how do we position humanitarian architecture and how do we avoid fetishizing it and actually but celebrate it for what it is? Flora. Golly, well, there's so many different things in that. I mean, for a start, I'm, I feel quite critical of um, projects where um, architecture schools, they set it, sort of glamorize a project overseas. There, there are examples of those projects built by schools of architecture which have been 
disastrous and left redundant after the people have come away, then nobody even wanted that project. Nobody even asked the community, do they want that project? And most seriously, nobody even discussed it with the local architectural profession, which is just as serious a profession as a profession here or anywhere. So it's deeply disrespectful, uh, it can be. Um, so I think there's a, there's a, uh, and I know that I'm sure Article 25 tangles with this, the relationship of people coming in to do projects and working with local communities, and that's a sort of double bind. In terms of fetishizing a craft, I believe that architecture will be very much digitalized, digitized, and will be on an app near you in the next six years. Um, I, and I think what will be left will be the user experience personally I think this is so there, and that may be deeply analog and about helping people uh, to create to take ownership of their buildings to learn to make and all the important identity things that come with that and uh, sustainability and all these other things and that can be in England with like Piers Taylor's work or it could be in India uh, and the other outside of it will be deep fundamentally digital and there'll be other kind of democra democratic things coming through the digital and other kinds of very problematic things as well um, um, I, I, I mean, I personally think that there's a, an absolute innate human need to, for craft and to do craft. And actually, the buildings that... One thing we know about buildings is that people love buildings that have been loved and crafted. Um, and, and real care has been taken with them. And in terms of the architect role, well, I, I'm highly critical of architects. And uh, I, I think we have... To, I mean, my mission about the demonstrating the value of architecture or architects is about... Architects who are good, they are ethical, they are research-led, and they are professional. And unfortunately, a very large proportion of our profession is not. So when I say architect, it's my kind of idealised how architects should be kind of category. Um, and maybe it is with Jatine, I don't know. Um, but, I mean, we do need to focus on the value of architects because it's so uh, under... Um, played at the moment. And actually, other members of the project team want architects to come forward and... Be, take leadership in as I'm discovering more as I get out into the construction industry so um, yes yeah, so there's a particular rep thing going on around you know about I think arch yeah. uh, value of architects are very interesting let me let Jatin in on the digital digital conversation I know um, nothing about digital yeah. but <clears throat> in a very related way um, one thing I found when I first went to India and it follows up from what Hanifa said is Anyone can build a building, and anyone does. Everyone calls themselves an architect, an engineer. You can go to Pondicherry Market and buy a license which allows you to submit a planning application. Uh, I think it's for five pounds. It's 250 rupees. It's less than five pounds. Two pound fifty. Yeah, yeah two pound fifty. You can call yourself an architect. And because the construction is so standardised, anyone involved in a construction project will tell you the steel reinforcement specification for a concrete frame. A two-way slab, they'll tell you how to do it. They've not even been to college. They're not qualified. Anyone can build. And I found that, um, rather than frightening, I found that quite liberating because you can have conversations with people about how to build. Now, forget what they actually build, but the point is that it's truly democratic. It's not a niche profession. Um, Everyone is building, and it, really, there's a building site on every street corner. But is, <coughs> can I jump in? Uh, um, or do you, uh, do you, do you want to go? Just, just a moment, yeah. okay. maybe. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, you segued very neatly there from the digital world to the fact that everybody in India knows about this. I want to kind of shake this. Well, they think up. they know. Yeah, they do. I know. The building, I, the yeah. building stand up. They do, yeah. yeah. Unless there's that alteration of the cement. And uh, <laughs> the... Uh, but this... You see, I'm sceptical about this digital narrative. That, that you know... Uh, and I think that there's a little bit of, um, you know, adapt or die kind of mentality. You know, everybody's telling you to... Uh, unless you adapt, you will die. And we're all yeah. rushing to digital and, and all that. Digital take-up in the developing world has crashed. And this is very new news. Actually, the rise of digital take-up has suddenly plateaued mm -hmm. around the world. And I think that this idea that we had that everybody will be as, as digital savvy as a, um, you know, somebody in, uh, 
in the proximity of Old Street Roundabout, uh, would it, it doesn't seem to be really happening. And, and actually many of these traditions are not, many of these ways of doing things, not necessarily traditions, are not necessarily going to be completely not sideways by, by this. And I, I wonder when you said, you suddenly said, I know nothing about digital, which I don't believe. No, I really so, don't. Um, you don't have to know, I mean, you, but you, you, you've got a phone. Yeah. Well, I've got guys from my office here who work with me, they'll tell you. Yeah. Is you know, it, no, nothing? Uh, no, <laughs> nothing at all? No. Okay. But, <laughs> okay, well, um, that, that, that was an interesting conversation we had there. So, uh, Sorry about the full stop. In, in, that, in that case, I will, I will say that I think it's, I, I'm sceptical. Uh, the the six-year thing, you know, m certainly in parts of the world, it's and it's fun. already there. Yeah. But uh, this whole conversation is not about really those parts of the world. No. And I think that um, there are some, some uh, problems to explore, even sticking to those parts of the world without bringing digital into it, if I may say so. Yeah. Um, and, and I think they are, they are more around, for example, this is a unique achievement by a pretty extraordinary person. I, I, you know, I don't want to just flatter you there, but, but it, is, it is an extraordinary thing. Not many people do it. It's unique because you don't see many people doing it. It's not you know, any other reason. And are we reliant on, on that? And how replicable is that? So I want to ask about the 200 villages that are coming down the line and the places that these buildings could be built. Are this just going to happen now without you? Um, the 200 villages are now open to Sarvam's services. Yeah. What happens internally is all down to local politics, um, which obviously we have no control over. But what's more interesting is the people who have been trained on this project, who have experience of working here, have carried those skills into the commercial world. So that means that some of the houses in the villages are made out of earth. Yeah. They've got pre-casting. So it's slightly, it's, it started to lift the quality of construction. We did a separate project on rainwater harvesting. Yeah. And the, the way that project has actually been copied in villages, far outstrips anything to do with building. You know, uh, you know, it's the water. So we did a model rainwater harvesting system and They've replicated, the masons who worked on it are replicating it everywhere. Mm. Well, I think when you measure social value of work like that, I think that's one of the most powerful things you could say, yeah. is that it actually has an afterlife. It's not that the <coughs> building was built and ex people were educated, and, and that's all very good. And people could go to school when it was actually 45 outside, but they were still uh, all right. But this, this is a, another level altogether. If, mm. And I wonder how to, and I think it'd be interesting to talk about how you sustain that and then how you spread it. Can I jump in with a question, which is, I'm, I mean, I'm quite interested in what's happened since 2014, and I wonder if you've been back or whether you've had news about sort of the changes over, uh, you know, not just in the building, but the surrounding context in the last four years. Well, there's, <coughs> as I mentioned, there's lots of measurement going on from research as a faculty. So during briefing 12 years ago, we kept talking about the future What's going to happen? Because there was a conviction that their methods were working in two hamlets and they, there were tangible differences on the ground. And somewhere, someone raised the whole issue of faculty. Have people from dedicated universities which deal with rural development doing six month stints at this, at this building. And that doubled the size of the building. And what they've actually started measuring is things like school attendance, um, health, mortality, really basic development parameters, which the programs in this building have definitely contributed to. So there's a whole uplift in the way of life. There are some things which are absolutely untouched. I mean, alcoholism, mm -hmm. still violence, mm -hmm. it's still there. And um, the thing I mentioned about women mm -hmm. not being, you know, not being able to give them even a raise, mm -hmm. you know, it was, yeah, shocking. but in some cases, what's basically happened is that they have partnered with government programs. So the biggest NGO in India is the Indian government and they deliver 
transformative projects on the ground through people like Sarvam, and they're now able to do that. So there has been a, a dramatic improvement in people's lives in certain sections. But it's a long-term process. I mean, we're talking about the building was finished four years ago. Let's see in 20 years what the metrics are. But I think you'll find, um, you know, change will happen faster than I actually. I, I mean, so. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking if you send some architectural research out, researchers out there um, to really look at, say, just the topography of how these villages may have changed and how these skills brought back to the villages, you know, even people just upgrading their own homes changes the way that the architecture mm. of that village looks. Mm. And then if you're saying that these skilled workers now have jobs in the city and can get jobs in the mm. city, then that idea of connecting them and, you know, is there investment by the government in terms of buses or infrastructure, you know, as well as people investing in their own homes that have changed the kind of nature of that place in a larger context? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, there are certain skills which are more popular than others and have had a bigger impact. For example, masonry, uh, stonework. Something which has had absolutely no impact is roofing. Everyone still wants a concrete slab. Mm -hmm. You know, that insecurity, generational insecurity of the rain, we want something solid, something that is secure. Mm. Um, everyone still wants a concrete slab, mm. you know, so mm. in, in that way, um, you're giving me ideas about how to measure this mm. now, you know, mm. through trades, different mm. trades. Mm. Earth plastering is really popular. Mm. Lime plastering, you know, breathable finishes to walls has come back. Uh, people are not obsessed with air conditioning. Mm. But we're talking about numbers. I mean, the populations are gigantic. Yeah. You know, I mean, you, just because you've got three houses in a village yeah. which have done something yeah. isn't right. going to change anything. Honey, um, I rudely oops. interrupted you before. No, no, it's fine. Oh, please. <coughs> it's, uh, if we're going to do th the 200, the only way to do it, and I'm completely with Flora, is through replicating using technology. We've gone through the techno kind of digital. We've gone post-digital. That's also already gone, frankly. The, the current age that many people are talking about, there are different people talking about different things. But there is, in my opinion, uh, a socio-technological age now where technology is already being, it's so vast, the, compu the compu brute force of computation power here is so good that we're almost able to occupy a new ecology, which is something between technique and nature. So we're not only occupying with technology um, uh, some things that machines can do faster, quicker, and think for itself mm -hmm. and produce so that human beings don't have to sweat for that. But we're even taking unnatural spaces like tops of mountains that we never occupied before. So I think there is a, a, an inevitable uh, solution that's coming from technology and you have to face it. Okay. And I don't believe that it's about uh, the inequitable problem. I, I recognize that inequ inequitable problems create mm. projects like the one you've <coughs> done because most of the people in that village probably don't know how to use apps and they wouldn't know how to replicate this building. But I do think as a bigger picture, mm. architects have a fantastic position because they, are, they sit between nature and technique uh, mm. as a discipline. We're technical. There is no doubt in my mind about that. And the more I see architects, the more I get closer and closer to nature, I see all you architects walking towards technique. And I find that really offensive because you're just not good enough to go that way. <laughs> and, and, and neither am I good enough to go in your direction. So on the bigger picture of his project, you know, I think if there was a case study and replica replication of it through the, the work you do or others are doing, through promoting young architects to, to design these things quicker, pass them to Indian architects who are just on first year degree courses and get on and do it. But technology is the answer. So uh, can you develop that, Flora? Because here's Jatin, he's done this uh, extremely carefully considered, uh, sensitive, highly crafted, but also it's a, it's a crafting of relationships as well and it's crafting of all sorts of things and not just materials. How, how do you think, um, because you said that you know, in six years it'll be digital, the digital and technological world that Hanif is saying, say how that would impact on improving the lives of the people in those 200 villages. 
that Sarvam is trying to serve? How, how, what is, what's there for them in this glorious world? Well, I did say, I think, that there's still going to be an incredibly analogue world left of craft and making. So I think that it will be at this hybrid place that Hanif's talking about, uh, of, of where the digital meets the craft. And I think there'll be things that we just can't even begin to imagine happening at that moment. I mean, I don't know, my husband comes from South America, and I see how people are innovating with stealing other people's electricity and this computer and that app and you know incredible creativity happening around technology I just uh, I, 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 I do think it's going to happen and in Britain we've got things like flying factories coming in um, with big giant flatbed scanners being left by people like Skanska in communities so that they can start pr preparing their um, building housing and stuff like that I mean this is sort of kind of uh, pioneering stuff, but it just doesn't seem to be too far until this will happen, this sort of merging with digitalness and handmaking, I think, in contexts such as the one that <coughs> Jatin's working with. And indeed, people, I imagine, in those countries or in places like that, you know, they want to be part of the 21st century. And it's the identity of the thing that's being made is really important too. I don't know what, Jatin, what do you think about that? Well, it's interesting because on, on this particular project, um, when, we start, when we started, um, very few of the workers had a mobile phone. And within sort of two years, everyone had a phone way better than mine. Everyone had a smartphone. Most people couldn't read or write. But what I found was it really helped the process. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, um, I could send, everyone knows numbers, I could send dimensions mm. to site via text message and the fact it was coming from via text message was very celebratory you know there was a whole kind of wow it's come by text message and they'd show each other and it, there'd be like sort of 10 times the interest whereas if I'd just given them a sketch mm. um, that enthusiasm isn't there <laughs> so yeah it's true so I'm, I do I, I think that it, the way their technology increased, the way they were able to consume and buy gadgets um, really helped. I wish I could have used it better. I could have done it far, far more. You know, I could have really harnessed it. But it made a huge difference in terms of instructions to site. Mm -hmm. And then once we started getting the, the ability to do site inspections <coughs> by phone, they click a photo, send it, and I'm in Manchester. I mean, that is also another way of working. I mean, it's, um, so we tried to harness it, but. Um, I had a feeling you knew more about digital than you were left. Well, they, <laughs> they knew, they know more about it than right, me, but yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, look, um, <coughs> is anybody going to ask a question out there in the audience? Because we could go on rabbiting on, you know. <laughs> so, is there a phone that we pass out, or is that how it works? <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> Oh, your, your I think I think they want the. Uh, no, I don't. You don't. No, you don't need it. It's only a member of the audience, right? Okay. I'm just um, fascinated by your approach to sustainability, and I just wondered if um, you had a battle at the beginning um, in terms of people's aspiration of what this building should be in terms of an exemplar. I mean, you've very much gone back to the earth, literally, um, but were people pushing for an air-conditioned you know, building that appears to be modern? Did you have to, did you have to battle to do something? Uh, like people were not worried about it looking modern, but air conditioning, yes, it's a really good point, actually. Um, and trying to explain the cost of air, air, but it was air conditioning it after it had been built. And to actually explain to that committee the cost of air conditioning that space and the kind of changes you'd have to make was a real battle. But what we did instead was um, <coughs> we argued about cooling the surfaces that your body is in touch with. So people in India walk barefoot. So if you cool the temperature of the floor, that makes a huge difference. And that granite slab that goes around, that is also cooled underneath. And I mean, it, it, was, a, it was a battle. It really was a battle. I mean, and there is an obsession with air conditioning, but this is a place where there's electricity three hours a day. Mm but you don't know which three hours. Mm. 
It could be the middle of the night. So <coughs> despite that, there was, a, there was um, a kind of a question about retrofitting it for air conditioning. <laughs> How was the floor cool then? <laughs> How did it work? In, in the screed, we embedded um, one inch dia food pipes, food grade pipes, yeah. and circulated water. We harvested rainwater which passed through a, a refrigeration unit. Okay. Ah. Yeah, um, which um, <laughs> one, of the, one of the very yeah. few kind of consultants who actually delivered on this project, he actually made it, he's like an inventor. Yeah in Bombay and he made it and sent it down and it reduces the temperature of the floor considerably. Yeah, that's very, that's very interesting. Flora, you mentioned monetizing social value. We'll, we'll, we'll just have a little commercial break for a minute. Okay, I'll just come back to you. No, actually, you're gone. <laughs> but I was just going to build on the question that he asked. So you mentioned somewhere in the presentation that it was the ambient air temperature was 45 with 100% relative humidity and you were able to achieve 30 degrees Celsius for the yeah. space that you showed. Probably is impractical to get 30 degrees. Impractical? Yeah. 32 we got. Because there's a lot of passive cooling in there as well. Well, it's naturally ventilated. You can't get better with passive measures than the external temperature. And if you are saying that you're going to take a benefit out of evaporative cooling, then you, ha you don't have uh, the relative humidity. Yeah, the I mean, it's, it's not 100% it's not humidity all the time but we were reducing the temperature considerably, yeah. achieving a, a, sub, a substantial temperature differential which made the internal, the area um, therm inside thermally comfortable. Without I, th I, th I think the, I think the, I understand your question because I was, I was wondering something similar because you actually don't have, uh, you're, it's totally open-sided as well, isn't it? Yeah. So the, 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 if you think of the, the breeze coming through, there's not very much time for that 45 to reach 32, but anyway, I think we can believe that people feel comfortable in this building, yes. you know, because they say so. <coughs> They've told you that, and so I think that the the but that's the, 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 the problem is that when when we are designing something in a developing world, the two things that we completely ignore is first comfort, and sustainability is taken in a more broader sense, where you start diluting the actual sense of measuring comfort in a building. And then what I see... So, sorry, is that, are you saying people are prepared to be more uncomfortable and we take that for granted? Well, that's definitely yes. yes. Why would you not say that? Yeah. That's definitely a true statement yeah. in developing nations especially and the organizations of people who are making those, these places yeah. as an experimental ground mm -hmm. to make buildings, they are probably not even gi giving the right answer mm -hmm. to those kind of uh, readings which are in a desperate requirement mm -hmm. to have more, to t are willing or maybe looking for more innovative solutions sure. rather than just making some shelters. I think this is a, this is a, this is an in, a very interesting question that we ought to develop further, um, maybe actually another time, because it's, it's, it's a kind of a new sort of equity issue, which is that we take for granted that people will bear you know, put up with, with higher temperatures. I would argue the other way, actually. I think people in the West should put up with higher temperatures. And I would say that actually 25 degrees, 26 degrees, we, people are, have, 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 you know, have, in, within two generations have lost the ability to, to actually be much more, um, risk, you know, uh, adapt much more to natural temperature variations. But anyway, that, that, that I, I'll start getting very nerdish if I this conversation goes on because I love this topic. But I want to ask, Flora, you mentioned this word monetizing social value. Uh, obviously, I think that, that means turning some of these goods. I think, Bo, you mentioned also some of the, the features. Is it, first of all, how do we do it? And secondly, is it, is it shooting yourself in the foot by turning everything into money? Well, I, I come from a feminist paradigm whereby you have to bring things forth, name things, to have them recognised. So I believe we have to play the game of this ridiculous game of economic monetising, which I don't know if you've come across Mariana Mazzucato's book, The Value of Everything, 
brilliant, just takes apart how the insanity of the way economics and, and uh, audit culture and everything is going on. So, but we have to play the game. And I think that if we are clever about this, we'll show that architecture so much social value, <laughs> such a lot of monetary value that everyone's going to go, oh, gosh. Uh, and, you know, it might have to change the game, actually. Um, that's my, that's my long-term vision. But you know, so, we, so there are really good monetizing uh, techniques like social return on investment, which sound much worse than they are, because actually what they are is deciding with the community community you're working with, what they value, so it's a very participatory thing, and then uh, trying to assign uh, monetary values to it using um, financial proxies, and there, it's a growing bank, the social value bank has a growing bank of financial proxies for different kinds of things. So um, I, I think it's a game we have to play in order that our, um, that our value, uh, the value of anything other than the minimum value. Yeah. <laughs> gets taken on board. Um, and uh, it's a game that the, certainly the government in the UK has now changed its treasury green book by which it does its cost benefit analyses mm -hmm. from um, just economic value to socioeconomic and environmental value. And we have to play the game and we have to give a decent offering mm -hmm. that, because I keep meeting politicians who really, really, or policymakers or people who are working in that zone, who are desperate for us to, to describe the value of architects in a manner that they can do business with. How would you do that in this? I mean, uh, is, it, is it relatively simple well, for it's in, in Jatin's case? Desperately not simple. Uh, but I mean, so, we're in, so there's a group of us working the New Economics Foundation and the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government, various architectural practices, um, working on developing a, a toolkit for a simple toolkit for architects to get out there and try to demonstrate their social value. And we're, we're going to do the beta version of it and it's going to come out next year. And it's always going to be deeply, deeply flawed, but it's a start. Is that something that uh, Jatin and co could use? Well, I would hope so, but it sounds to me like we've got things to learn from Jatin because he's, well, course, he's, he's developing all manner are, of are techniques. Are you actually monetizing uh, the, the value, social value? Uh, I'm not, no, um, but I hope the client yeah. is. Yeah. They would be interested in that, wouldn't they? Because that would be part of their submission to, to fund. The Cadbury money runs out now, or is it still? The, Capri the Cadbury money uh, ran out when Kraft took over. Right. Okay. So, um, so Kraft, uh, oh, and they cut, they, they cut it. Yeah, so that's... Ah. Right. Half the That's building. history. I see. So but, but it's interesting, what, just following <coughs> on, yeah. when, I do, when I do a pitch to a funding body, they ask for cost benefits. Mm. They want to know, OK, you want to do a building for this NGO, prove that incomes generally go up. Mm. Prove it. And prove that it goes up not because of inflation, mm. but because you are skilling up people. Mm. They ask very, very pointed questions. Mm. But that's where technology comes in, and I'm glad you mentioned Mariana. <coughs> Pervasive analytics and beautiful diagrams that show you're making progress, mm -hmm. a profit, usually convince anyone. Yes, exactly. You can Photoshop a very good solution. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's, this is where I think Mariana is coming from, and she comes in from the inside of the economic circle. And we've all seen <coughs> the McKinsey's of the world do very well with this kind of stuff. But when you look b underneath the hood of the data, it's got architecture underneath it. It's got design underneath it. But we're not gaining the values of, of what, what they're doing. So mm -hmm. I think you shouldn't beat yourself up too much about having to use technology <coughs> to make your point. It's, uh, it's the fastest way to get to the mind. OK, I think we, we, we're nearly uh, towards the end. But do you think this could be of relevance in the UK, this way of working? Jatin. Asking me. You, well, you, you're, you're the person who genuinely uh, knows lots about Pondicherry and South India. You also know a lot about Manchester in the UK. Right. So Manchester in the UK mm. looks more and more like yeah. Pondicherry. Yeah. So when I talk about, when I talk about um, poverty, there's different types of poverty. For example, poverty of lack of skill, lack of education, poverty of health poverty of aspiration, poverty of opportunity. Mm. I see a mirror every time I take that plane. Mm. What I, where the mirror stops is in India, you have enormous government welfare programs, you have dedicated NGOs, you have a generosity of philanthropism, and people want to join the modern age. They want the digital stuff, they want running water, 
in Manchester, I don't see any movement towards it at all. I just see it sliding backwards. And I think the two worlds are going to flip very quickly. And so the issues are the same. The question is, we don't have the NGOs who are going to enable this to happen. We, maybe you need Saravam UK. Um, and I think architects and engineers and designers need a passion to be able to take this on. You've got to, th these issues, have got, you've got to be passionate about it, and then you can make it happen. Um, so I used to think, no, it cannot be done, but now I think the ground is the same, the poverty is the same. Um, you, can, you, can, you can do it. And I think architects could do it by, say, doing self-build. Mm -hmm. It could be at a very small scale, but it can be done. Um, but buildings by themselves are not going to solve mm -hmm. any social sure. issues at all. I mean, it's, you need that agency in the middle that drives it. What's your current project? I was just explaining. Um, we for many years we've been trying to do a to renovate a franco tamil villa on the beach and um, we have a bunch of guys here who actually help measure it um, and finally we've got the funding sorted we're going to do a proper renovation pro a conservation project mm -hmm. um, but we're waiting for funds various things like that but um, right. so it will have a training element to it so last words well done. Well done. <laughs> well done, Jatin. Really inspiring. Thank you very much. I think the, the biggest thing to take from this is how much of a labour of love mm -hmm. it was and how that commitment to a project, that long-term commitment to a project, you know, seven years on a project, is what really drives it, it being done properly. You know, had you left in the middle, it, the outcome would have been completely different, for example. Um, you know, and that... I think the process of, you, you keep saying training up <coughs> local people, but it's, it's an exchange. They're, they're learning while you're training and mm -hmm. you're learning from them and exactly. it, you're sharing all of that responsibility. So that trust, that responsibility, it's, it's, it's a coalition of the willing that you've got. Um, you know, that time put in, that energy put in to build up those relationships, you, I'm, I'm assuming, worked all those issues out together it wasn't you just figuring out telling everyone what to do it might have started that way but i imagine that as the process went along you were in it together mm -hmm. and you know the <coughs> common goal is there the common topic is there for everyone to get it done yes. and i think that can be you know that lesson can be shared across any projects mm -hmm. uh, not just ones like these i think it's incredible and i i suspect that if you want to do it here or anywhere in the world I would go back to risk. <laughs> if you take a bigger risk, you can achieve it. So if architects want to do these sorts of projects, mm -hmm. they should throw a little bit of money, group up, and do it. And by that I mean clients like this, for example, and the architect for this building, took a risk in exposing concrete, putting water pipes in there. Suddenly it's become something new. It, is, it isn't. Mm -hmm. And that was a risk taken not only by the client, mm -hmm. but he, was, you know, he, he went towards it by his hand being you know, up his back because the architect truly believed in it and we did. So I think if you take the risks as profession slowly, uh, and I don't think we have a lot of time, and most projects take seven years. It doesn't really matter whether it's a city or a building, it seems to take seven years. It, it's, that, you know, it's, the, it's the way we are. Uh, so I think I would say that through the education and through what Article 25 do in our APA and others, if we can find better ways of valuing ourselves, which is partly about taking the risk. I thought it was absolutely wonderful and amazing, and I saw so many resonances with the work of uh, the whole Article 25 team, because I think this is a, this is a profession which is actually, this profession of, of work of this kind, I don't mean architects, I mean what we do and the way you, for example, read the place, read the situation, you understood and got underneath what was needed in a very profound way that most you know commercial practices cannot standard architectural templates you know the brass plate architect can't it's exactly what article 25 the, the team does it reads the situation with no prejudice i'm not being an architect not being an engineer i'm actually very directed to the outcome of what what's going to happen 
and then you apply a sort of a forensic and entirely open-minded approach to solving those things. And out of it comes, come these miracles. And somehow, what always amazes me is that beauty comes out of it too. Uh, because at all times, you're also always making judgments. You don't talk about those judgments, but they emerge. And in our best work as well, you know, it, it's, it's very noticeable. And this is why I, I disagree with Fashid. They might not be very good at doing architecture in a standard way, uh, those people that she was talking about, but those who actually really read the place and understand and leave beside, behind their prejudices, don't worry about whether it's cheap or expensive. You know, cheap isn't bad, cheap is great. For us, cheap is fantastic. And you know, that's not, that, that's a, I think that takes a special skill, and you've demonstrated it in bucket loads, for which we are very grateful. Thank you very much, Athene.